ask us about them. You are not responsible for them. And the other part of predestination are the things which Allah gave us control over. And these things which He gave us control over, He sent us guidance. He told us, do this, don't do that. Everything is explained to us in the Qur'an to lead a life that leads us to what pleases Allah and what takes us away from hellfire. The commands and prohibitions. Anytime Allah commands us with something to do, prohibits us from something to do, something not to do, know that this is in your control. And we said, how do we explain that second part, that if something is in with your control, then where is God's will? We explained that very simply, that it is God's will that he granted us the gift of choice. He gave us some control over certain things. But no matter what we do and what we choose not to do, we never have full control over everything. If you do something, we don't have full control of the outcome. If you want success, how successful would it be? We have some control and some of it we don't. If something happens to us, we have control in fixing or solving or learning from it afterwards, but we don't have control of changing the past, for example, or changing the consequences. So we have some control, and the things we have no control over, we're not questioned about. Of course, there are things that we do, and we know that God told us, be careful, there could be a cat catastrophic consequence from this, and then when we disobey Allah in that deliberately and a catastrophic consequence happens, even if we didn't want that to happen, that is on you. Because you had a conscious choice and you knew any possibility of the outcome can happen. We can't turn around and say, but I didn't intend for that much harm to happen to someone or to myself. But you did have the choice of to, to go that direction or not. If Allah wills it, it can be a small consequence or a big consequence or no consequence. Brothers and sisters, Allah does not judge us for what happens, but rather our choices, what we made. Brothers and sisters, we answered many questions like this. And we said that there is God's pre-measurement. So we've done predestination, pre-measurement. Pre-measurement are all the laws around us that govern this entire universe and govern your life that we work within them. Such as when you plant a seed, that's your choice to plant the seed. How big the seed grows, how big the tree grows, how many fruits it bears, how healthy it is, how long it lives, is not in your control. These are laws which Allah created laws in nature. If you... Uh, if you are negligent and you don't care about how you make things, let's say you're an engineer, a carpenter, an electrician, a plumber, you're a doctor, you're whatever you want to be, anything, and you are negligent in your work and something goes wrong, this is on you. But the laws around it that Allah said cause and effect, if you do this, this will happen, these laws are pre-measured. Allah measured everything in this entire universe to be the way it should be. And they all work within Allah's measurement, within Allah's precise, precise measurement, precise laws that he made. No one can work, work outside those laws. For example, Allah did not create the human being with wings to fly like a bird. So if you jumped off a cliff without any invention that, or gliders or, or anything that keeps you up, you're not going to fly, you're going to fall. Because the laws of Allah is that the humans don't have wings, they can't fly. You'd have to make an aeroplane to fly. Isn't that correct? A fish swims. If you take the fish out of the sea, except for a whale, if it's not a mammal, it's going to die because there's no oxygen. Well, there is oxygen in the water, but when it goes out, to be technical, it can't breathe the oxygen as it does in the water. Why? Because the laws of Allah are that way. You do something, there is a consequence. These laws, my dear brothers and sisters, cannot be changed. They are called the pre-measures of Allah. Allah measured them precisely, and Allah called them the sunnah of this world. You cannot ever find 
that the laws of Allah which he made in this world can ever be changed, nor can they ever be taken off course. Some people we mentioned say, what about evolution, the theory of evolution? We say to you, if the theory of evolution is correct, there is no problem for, for Muslims. And in fact, part of it agrees with the Islamic uh, belief of Qadr. But if evolution is true, this is a law and a process and a condition of how life grows and continues and changes. All of that is within Allah's pre-measurement. He measured it to be that way. For example, if you are of African descent and somebody else is of Asian descent and you got married, a man and a woman, your children are going to be a new type of breed. Yani they're a human being, but a new type of ethnicity, a new look. This is within evolution, but we say this is within God's, Allah's pre-measurement laws. Isn't that correct? Some people breed cats or they breed animals or birds and to bring out new uh, you know, new species. All of this speciation is Allah's laws. All of it is within Allah's pre-measurement. But you cannot work outside those laws. You cannot work outside what? Those laws. You cannot bring, for example, um, what can I say? Fire. You cannot bring fire and water together and then expect an ice cube to result from it. You can expect vapor, but you cannot expect an ice cube because the laws that Allah created don't work that way same with our lives Allah pre-measured everything and we are not questioned about his laws a good example is what one brother here mentioned to me by uh, Rahmatullah alayhi, the Shaykh al-Sha'rawi he was asked, if you know him, he's an Egyptian scholar and he was asked about the difference between Qadr, Qadr and the Qadr which we have control we have some control or choice over and the qadr, qadr in which we have some choice and the qadr we don't have choice. And he gave a good example. He said it's like when you board an aeroplane. You're inside the aeroplane and it's flying. You can move around within certain limits in the aeroplane. Isn't that correct? You can drink, you can sit, you can stand, you can put the seat belt on, you can take it off, you can pray, you can sleep, you can go to the toilet, you can eat. You can break the law, and then there's consequences. But these are all within your choice. But you don't have a choice over where the aeroplane took off from, where the aeroplane is going to land, how high the aeroplane is flying, how fast the aeroplane is going. You have no control over that. If you break the law in the aeroplane, that was your choice, and you have to suffer the consequence. If you do the right thing, you will have a safe, a good journey, an enjoyable one to a certain extent, but you don't have control over the time, the distance. Anything that happens to the aeroplane, if it lands in the wrong place, if it doesn't fly the right way, that's the pilot's fault or someone else's fault, not yours. Same with this world. Imagine this world is like the aeroplane. You are on it. You're born at a certain time. You will die a certain time. That's where you took off. That's where you will land. You have conditions in this world. Anything within those limits are your choices and your consequences. And when you are born, when you die, how long you're going to live, these are Allah's Allah's choices. Of course, you have some control over your health, your exercise, and all of this is within the whole package of Allah's predestination and pre-measurement. All of it. Is this clear up to here? Alhamdulillah. As I said, review the last three lessons for more details, technical details on all the questions that may come to your mind. Today, insha'Allah, I want to address the last two points. The last two points. I'll address the last two points, insha'Allah. Someone asked me about an authentic hadith which is collected in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim about the story between the prophets Adam and Musa alayhim salam And the hadith goes like this. Ihtajja Adam wa Musa. Adam, Adam, and Moses, they had a disagreement. They had a debate or, an, or a friendly argument, an, an intellectual argument. فَقَالَ لَهُ Musa. Moses said to Adam, أَأَنْتَ آدَمُ 
الذي أخرجتك خطيئتك من الجنة Are you Adam the one whose sin eating from the tree which Allah forbid the one whose sin took him out of paradise out of the garden in another hadith he told him it is are you the one is are you the one whose sin made all of us end up on earth فقال له ادم ادم said to moses انت موسى الذي اصطفاك الله برسالاته وبكلامه are you moses the one whom allah chose him to give him the scripture the torah the torah and chose you to be the one he spoke to directly ثم تلومني على امر قدر علي قبل ان اخلق then after all that you blame me for something which was predestined for me before i was even created the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam says fa qala rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam fa hajja adam musa fa hajja adam musa adam 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 overcame over adam beat musa in the argument adam beat musa in the argument he had a stronger argument so they asked me how do we explain that adam alayhi salam we know the story of adam that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he put him in what we call jannah is it the jannah we're going to inshallah that is destined for those who obey allah and then succeed or is it a different type of jannah only allah knows it seems it was some garden of paradise of a certain level that allah created adam and eve and then placed them in there for a little while and he told them as you know the story do not eat from that tree a particular tree in paradise he said don't eat from it and he told them warned them against shaitan do not listen to the shaitan he is your enemy to both adam and who and hawa eve don't listen to him he is your enemy so the warning was there the command was there and there was one sin only one sin no other sin and that is do not eat from the tree and beware of the shaitan otherwise he said there will be a terrible outcome a bad outcome as time went on the shaitan iblis without going through the whole story iblis he had it in for adam and the rest of us because he had promised allah before he made a promise a bad promise is i am going to lead all of the children of adam astray and i'm going to take whoever i can to hellfire and allah said to him try my sincere servants you'll have no power over them so he went to adam and eve and he made up all these philosophical you know beliefs and kept talking to adam and whispering to adam and whispering to eve whispering and confusing them for about 40 plus years 40 plus years allahu alam if that's authentic or not but we find in tafsir and kathir it was about 40 plus years he kept on changing his arguments and convincing them until adam got confused he forgot he forgot what the command really was it didn't mean that he forgot that allah had told him don't eat from the tree he forgot what the it could have been that he forgot what the command meant what the meaning of it meant what the purpose of it meant what so you know how sometimes this explains to us sometimes we, in this earth you go on youtube or any you know all the social media and you get bombarded with all these people trying to prove for example islam wrong or the quran wrong and they cause you doubt sometimes there are even muslims themselves who want to twist islam for their own agenda and they want to create a modernist view of islam or what they call a so called progressive view but what they do is they're twisting the meanings of islam they'll bring you an ayah or a hadith and they say it's correct it's in the quran but it means this and it means that and you get confused hasn't that happened before 
They bring you a verse, and they don't deny, but they confuse you. So this is what could have happened to Adam, alayhi salam. Iblis confused him until Adam forgot the original clear command of Allah. And so he ate from the tree, him and his wife Eve, Hawa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away the light that was covering them. And they felt naked because there was light covering them. They felt naked. And this is an indication, brothers and sisters, that when we sin, when we go off the guidance of Allah, our shame starts to decrease. When you're a child, there is a natural shame that comes to you. If you've noticed, if you have little daughters or a little son, when they reach a certain age, they get a bit embarrassed for you to go and take them to the toilet. Right? Or the shower. They start telling you by themselves, just turn around, they don't know why. This is a fitrah. So when you start sinning and you go against Allah's laws, the natural consequence of that is that your shame begins to go down. You, you start to get used to it and you don't feel the shame of it, the guilt of it, as time goes on, so long as you continue. So what happened is that the shaitan, he started doing that to them. After that, brothers and sisters, Adam forgot and he ate from the tree. This was revealed. And then he immediately asked Allah to forgive him. He said, oh Allah, forgive me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. Then Adam and Hawa ended up on earth. Tayyib. How do we explain that? Somebody will come up and say, hmm. Allah says in the Quran, وَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى Adam disobeyed his Lord and he fell into error. Does that mean? Doesn't that mean that if I sin, it was the will of Allah? Since Adam told Moses, I disobeyed Allah, you know this was written upon me before. It's not my fault. That's how you might understand it. Isn't that correct? In this case, a lot of people might say, well, it explains why I don't pray. It explains why I don't wear the hijab. It explains why I lie. It explains why I've got a girlfriend and boyfriend. It explains why I sleep around. It explains why I steal. It explains why I'm a criminal. Isn't that right? The list goes on. There is no blame then on anybody who does anything wrong, any crime. All we can say is, well, you know, if Adam, he disobeyed Allah and he said to Moses, it's because Allah had written this upon me, it's not my fault, well, then all of us now are free. We just do anything you want, really. And we can all say, it's God's qadr. That's a problem, isn't it? That's a problem. The answer to that is, again, this is a misunderstanding. What Adam salam is referring to is not his sin. You see, some people, they read parts of the Qur'an and parts of hadith, and they don't read what's before or after, and they don't know other hadiths and Qur'anic verses that explain it. Allah, He is referring to, Adam is referring to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed before He created him. What did he, Allah say to the angels when He was about to create Adam? What did He say in Surah Al-Baqarah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh -huh. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Behold, when your Lord said to the angels, I am going to place on earth a trustee who will give birth to generations and pass on to other generations, meaning the humans. So where was Adam destined to be? In Jannah or on earth? On earth. And Adam is saying, this was already decided by Allah, before I even disobeyed, that he was putting me on earth anyway. And now Moses, with all the scripture that you got, the Torah, and there's another hadith, he says to him, when, when was the Torah written before you received it, O Moses? And Moses said to him, the Torah was written 40 years before Allah created the creation. He said, if the Torah was written 40 years before the creation of creation, and isn't it in the Torah it says that I'm going to disobey and end up in error? 
He said, yes. He said, your Torah said this 40 years before it came down. That means it was Allah's Qadr. What is he referring to? That Allah was originally going to put Adam on earth anyway. So why was he in paradise, in Jannah? This is a wisdom from Allah. Allah knew that if he put Adam in Jannah, and he warned him about the shaitan, Adam was going to show a weakness which Allah wants us to see as humans. He wanted to introduce us to our weaknesses. He wanted to introduce us to paradise, that this is the end place. This is where you're going. That's the final destination that you have to work towards. Because it really hits you that Adam was actually in the garden. It wasn't just on earth. And he wants us to know that the shaitan, Iblis, he, did, he's, he won't settle with just making you do wrong things in this earth. He will keep going with you until his end destiny, which is not to let you go to paradise at all. And so you can go to hellfire forever. He will not just settle for little deeds, even big deeds. He wants to make sure you completely leave Islam, you leave your Lord, you disbelieve in Allah, and you end, never enter paradise. That was the wisdom behind it. And so Allah put Adam in paradise for us to learn this valuable lesson throughout time. SubhanAllah, it's not only Muslims, all religions know this, mostly the Christians and Jews, the Abrahamic faiths. They all know about this, except they got it wrong in one way. They thought that Adam, because he ate from the tree, God became angry at him. Angry. You know, lightning bolts and everything. And he punished him by placing him on earth. And now, we're being punished. This is wrong. In Islam, this is wrong. We don't, Islam does not teach us that. Islam believes that the sin that Adam did has nothing to do with the will that Allah made to place us on earth. They're two separate matters. Okay, so why does Allah say Adam disobeyed and he erred? Adam salam did not intentionally disobey. Remember what we said. He forgot. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ عَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ آدَمَ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَنَسِي وَلَمْ نَجِدْ لَهُ عَزْمًا Most certainly we had given Adam a command before, but he forgot. We found him lacking in firmness of resolution, meaning he did not show firmness of purpose and determination, meaning his temptations and confusions overcame him due to what shaitan tricked him with in his verbal gymnastics and his confusing philosophies. You understand? Adam forgot. And forgetfulness, pay attention. Pay attention. Forgetfulness, is it the qadr of Allah or not? Of course it's the qadr of Allah. But it's not the type that you're responsible for. Forgetfulness is split into two parts. One of it, you are not responsible for. It's within your biology. You didn't mean it. You forgot Allah, you remember what the Prophet ﷺ said? He said, an nisyan. For my nation, if they forget or they make a mistake, Allah does not hold them accountable. If you forgot your salat or you forgot or you made a mistake in your salat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not sin you for, for genuinely forgetting and genuinely making a mistake. But Allah does sin you for your de- negligence and lack of care and as a result, you forgot. That one is your fault. Because you were deliberately negligent and careless. Deliberately, don't care. That's a different story. Adam was not careless. Nor was he negligent. But he did not have the strong willpower that was needed to overcome his, his confusion. And his firm determination and memory. And that is a weakness of humans. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, Nasiya Adam fa Nasiya Adam fa Nasiya SubhanAllah, I forgot the, the exact text. Fa Nasiya Banu Adam. Yani the, the meaning of Astaghfirullah, Rasul ﷺ said, the hadith is authentic. He said, Adam forgot and so his children inherited forgetfulness. And this also shows you a little bit of science here that The progeny of Adam began to forget. So we do inherit from our parents' behaviors in our genetics. And you can alter that and change your behavior, and then your children can inherit good behavior. And that is why sort of in Islam, uh, breastfeeding is a big deal. 
Uh, if, if, if a baby is still developing, especially in its first few months, and another mother breastfed that baby, that baby, four, four full breastfeedings, that baby becomes your brother, your foster brother or your foster sister, and that new mother becomes his foster mother. So not allowed to marry her anymore because some of her genetics alter the genetics of the baby or have, have a, a role in there. So behavior of human beings, according to Islam and according to science, seems to be correct that you do inherit it. And we have inherited from Adam and Eve a lot of this. Now, that was how humans are. And it was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be that way. So brothers and sisters, let me go back. Adam alayhi salam did not say that he came down to earth because of his sin. He came down, he said, because Allah had willed that he was going to be on earth anyway. The fact that he was in paradise was meant to be for a short time anyway, because Allah wanted to take, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to manifest a big lesson for all of mankind till the end of time to learn from. That the shaitan is our enemy. He will always be trying to put doubts in our heads, whispers. Um, our minds are weak, so avoid listening to people who give you doubts. Avoid bad friends. They can influence you. And remember that you are a forgetful human being. God commands you and prohibits you. But at the same time, if you forgot, if you made a mistake, and even if it was deliberate, you've always got a way out. Just like Adam repented to Allah, Allah forgave him immediately you can also get out of any sins by repenting and changing your ways. And Allah will forgive all your sins completely, so long as you are genuine. So the shaitan has no room if you stay along Allah's guidance. Is this clear so far, brothers and sisters? You sure? Okay. Insha'Allah ta'ala. When Adam made that sin... And he disobeyed. I just had one more thing I didn't say. He did not disobey deliberately. It was unintentionally. So why does Allah say he disobeyed? In Arabic, in the Arabic language, when you say asa, it can mean a deliberate rebellion. You rebel. I'm not going to listen deliberately. And another meaning for asa means a natural, just doing the opposite. So the fact is that he did the opposite of what Allah said. That was just a fact. But it was not intentional. Yani in Arabic we say khalafa. Khalafa, he just did the opposite. But he was unintentional. It was unintentional. Um, Faghawa, Allah says he went to error. This is a very, very light word. It says he slipped in another version of translations. They say he slipped. <laughs> it's for, for people of other religions like Christians and maybe Jews, I'm not sure. This is a big deal to say all this... It's just a slip, a little tiny error of Adam alayhi salam. Because as I told you, their entire belief of why we're here totally goes against what Islam taught us. For Islam, again we say, we separated between his sin, which he slipped, and the will of Allah that he was going to end up in, on earth anyway. But he, Allah subhanahu wa just utilized that opportunity to teach us an everlasting lesson. And that is why Allah says in the Quran, at the end of it, in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 27, he says... يا بني آدم لا يفتننكم الشيطان كما أخرج أبويكم من الجنة. O oh son of Adam, O oh children of Adam, let not Shaytan deceive you in the manner he deceived your parents out of the garden. The Shaytan did not take him out of the garden. Allah took him out of the garden, but deceived meaning. In other words, do not forget the lesson that you learned from how when they were in the garden, shaitan deceived them. And that was before I took them out of the garden. That's what it means. That lesson, remember it. He will deceive you, meaning, see how I took him out of the garden? I did that for a lesson. It means that the shaitan can take you out of your paradise as well. But now, here, you are not in paradise yet. You are destined, insha'Allah. But you either hold it and, and keep it, or you lose it. And remember, the shaitan is out there to make you never go into it. That's what it means. Don't let him deceive you to take you out of paradise. Because look at the lesson I just gave you. Do you understand? It's like a teacher, a good teacher who comes up and wants to influence their students and c encourage them if he finds that students are, are, are not really into it and, they, and then they say listen 
Have you ever had A's before? And I will say, no, no, we've never had, we've always a failure. Then that's, the teacher says, all of you have A's. If I were to write your report right now, you're all A's. They go, really? Without doing anything? Without doing anything. But here's the condition. You either keep the A or you lose it. It's up to you. And that's exactly what Allah is telling us. Don't let the shaitan take you out of paradise. Don't let him deceive you the way he took your forefathers out, meaning the way I made the lesson happen. Otherwise, inshallah, you're all destined to Jannah. Just keep it or you can lose it. It's up to us. <sighs> Is that okay? Alhamdulillah. Now the second part, inshallah, and it's the last part. Remember in my first lesson, we talked about something called, I called the, the four ways of how to react to suffering. Before I say that, this whole lesson that I just gave you about Adam alayhi salam, the scholars developed a rule, a concept. What is it? Learn it and memorize it. You cannot use qadr as an argument for your sins. If you disobey Allah, you can't say, it was the qadr of Allah that I sinned. But you can use qadr as an argument for sufferings that happened to you that were not in your control. Do you understand the difference? Yuhtajju bil qadari ala al masaibi wa la yuhtajju bil qadari ala al maaibi wa la yuhtajju bil qadari ala al maaibi. You can use the qadr to justify or to, 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 to justify calamities that happen to you that are out of control, but you cannot use qadr to justify your sins. You understand? This is what we learn from here. When these now when qadr happens to you that is outside of your control, we call them masaib, calamities, hardships, things that happen to you you never wanted. It was never your fault. And it's not really a fault. It's just a pre-measurement and predestiny from Allah. There is always a reason and a purpose for whatever happens to you or in this world that is outside of your control. Even the earthquakes, the volcanic eruptions. If an asteroid hit this earth, the rotation of the earth, the slowing down, the, fa the, 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 the pacing faster, your life, your death, your sicknesses, all of these brothers and sisters where you have no business in the matter, when you have done nothing that logically can lead to that and you can't make sense of it, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is outside of your control. Allah is not going to ask you why did you get sick unless you made yourself sick deliberately. Allah is not going to ask you why did you get old and tired. This is not your fault. Allah is not going to ask you why didn't you stand up in prayer when you had no legs. Allah is not going to ask you why didn't you this or that when you had no power to do it? But when they do happen, you have to go through it. We usually call them sufferings. But unfortunately, the word suffer has a negative connotation to us. It sounds bad. But actually, subhanAllah, Islam is the only religion in the world, as far as I know, which emphasizes, like talks so much about embracing suffering and having a relationship with it. Isn't that weird? That we have a relationship with our suffering. And that is the correct way to go. Can you avoid suffering in life? Can you? Can you avoid pain, for example? Do you hide under the table and pain goes away, for example? No. Every person in this universe suffers in one way or another. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that you will suffer. How? He says, We always try you through different types of good and bad as a fitna, meaning as a purification. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَدْحًا فَمُلَاقِيهِ O Messenger of God, in brackets, Muhammad Allah is talking to Prophet You will go through this world 
through lots and lots of hardships and struggles until you meet your Lord. So there is no escaping. Allah says, To the end of the ayah, we shall certainly make you go through different colors and shades of fear, hardships, loss of wealth, loss of lives, all that stuff. Give good news to those who are persevering, patient and persevere, they don't give up. And the ones who say, to Allah we belong and to Him we shall return. That's, that's at the end of the day, this is what it's all about. This is what solves your problem, my dear brothers and sisters. We need to change that mentality. The great companion, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, used to say, the mornings that I wake up with a fever, fever, I am the happiest. I know, this is beyond us, they're companions of the Prophet. But as an example, they said, why? He said, because the fever reaches every part of my body. And I hope from Allah that I get rewarded for every part of my body as well. Because you know, Allah doesn't just make you go through that for nothing. All of it is good for you, if you take it that way. It becomes bad for you, if you rebel, you blame Allah, you blame people, you blame the society, you blame the wind, you blame the, the, the ants that crawl outside your backyard, you blame the crow that landed in your backyard, you just blame something. These people have not reaped the benefit of that suffering. Allah says in the Quran, Inna ma'al usri yusran, inna ma'al usri yusra. Allah repeats it twice. In case you didn't get it the first time, He repeats it twice. He says, Indeed, inna means as a matter of fact, without a doubt. With every hardship, there are many eases. With every hardship, there are always eases. Meaning, when a hardship comes to you, it's a package that comes with bad things and goodies. If you persevere through it, you'll walk away with the goodies and the bad will be forgotten. I know you're all men here, but we have sisters here. Maybe women can relate to that and maybe we can learn a little bit. When they're pregnant and they give birth, the pain they go through, subhanAllah, the struggles they go through, it's tremendous. And then when they give birth, shortly afterwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns her body back to healing and so on and all this homeostasis stuff and everything. And then subhanAllah, you think that she'll never do it again. Yeah, as many mothers, the love comes in, the compassion comes in, this connection, the moment they lay their eyes on their baby when it opens the eyes, maybe the moment you as a father, can you explain that love that you feel when it happens? We can't even explain it. Then she wants another baby <laughs> shortly after. The man looks at her and thinks, my God, how? Why would you want another baby after all that torment? And she'll just say, you don't understand. True. With every hardship, there is ease. But you need to reap that benefit. And uh, the scholars were asked, how do I know if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is punishing me or if he's rewarding me? You see, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. That's the wrong question. In life, this life is not created to reward or punish. The reward and punishment is in the hereafter. Yes, there are some consequences that you suffer. And it's a kind of punishment, but it's not the punishment for your good or bad deeds. It's just the consequences of your bad deeds that Allah created in this world. And if you do suffer those consequences, here's the thing. If you are patient with them and accept them and change your ways, they become your savior. But if you don't embrace them and you use them to rebel more, they become part of your punishment that is connected to your hereafter. Do you understand the difference? So brothers and sisters in Islam, your reaction to it is what matters. And that is why the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us that Allah says, Allah says, I am the way that you think of me in a positive way. Allah, you can't think of him in negative. Allah is not negative, he's positive. But it is us who create the negativity. Hard to believe, but that's how it is. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said in a famous hadith, I find it amazing, the state of a believer. When good happens to them, they are grateful and they don't boast. And when bad happens to them, they are patient and persevere and don't give up. And no matter what happens to the believer, it's always good. And that can never be except for a believer. 
Because your connection is with Allah. To Allah we belong and to Him we shall return. So at the end of the day, I, once some people said, how do I fix that mindset? We said, imagine yourself that you have already died and you are already standing on the day of judgment before Allah. And your records are displayed in front of you. And you cannot return back. You wish you can. But you're stuck. Khalas. You're going to move forward. And in front of you, you're only going to paradise or hellfire. Imagine you're standing there and you look at your records. And you see what you were doing in secret, in public, when you cheated this person, when you looked at that thing. When you, when you, when you, when you. You would want to go back to change it. Isn't that right? Imagine looking at yourself doing that stuff and you are sweating and burning with embarrassment and with fear. Say, I don't want to look at it. And you just want to change it. You say to yourself, don't do that, don't do that. You're talking to yourself. Imagine your soul, your dead body is talking to your live body. You're looking backwards. Imagine yourself, you're already in the hereafter, which is the reality. Right now, you think like that. And imagine that you are looking backwards. You are looking back on this life. This life is like a movie. It started and ended. You're looking at yourself. What things would you change? Now that you've got yourself in that mindset, live your life as if you are in the hereafter. When you go to work, when you go to study, when you get married, when you go home, when you read, when you listen, when you watch, when you go and come, when you deal, when you business, when you learn, when you educate, whatever you do. Think, if I was in the hereafter looking at myself right now, what would I tell myself? What would I want myself to see? If you can have that mentality, and you can, over time you develop that habit, subhanAllah. That's how the, that's how the great sahabas and the, and, the, and the great predecessors and the people that you see when they hear the Qur'an, they cry. It's because they got into that mentality. They don't, they're not living here, they're living in the hereafter. Just their bodies here. <laughs> and that level, man, it, there's no limits to it. That spirituality has no limits to it. You can rise higher than the angels. And for example, I don't know if this is authentic or not, but its meaning is correct. It says that Umar radiallahu anhu or some other companion said, if I were to see hellfire with my eyes, it would not increase my belief in that it exists. I don't know, as I said, if he really did say that, but this is an absolutely correct meaning. Yeah, and a person can reach a level where as the Prophet ﷺ said, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تراه. The highest level. There is a level called Islam, which is what we're all on. Then you have Iman, where you feel a strong connection. And then you have Ihsan. That's even a higher level. Not many people have it. And, and Jibreel ﷺ said, Ya Rasulullah, tell us what Ihsan is. And he said, it is to worship Allah as if you can see Him. But although you know you cannot see Him, you are certain that he is always seeing you. He's always watching you. Imagine that you are at work or you're in the classroom or whatever and there's a camera and that camera is connected to your parents' house and they're watching that student, they're watching their son or daughter, how they're acting. Or at work, everybody's watching you. Wouldn't your behavior change? Of course it'll change. So this is what Ihsan basically is. So how do we react, brothers and sisters, like that, inshallah? And we keep going. So, four things to remember. Number one, if you fall into suffering that is outside of your control, always remember, number one, this could be a plan that Allah has for me. A plan is going to come out of this. And all you need to do is recite Surah, Yasi, Surah uh, Yusuf, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. story of Yusuf is all about that first concept. That Allah has a bigger plan. The problem is that we humans, unfortunately, but that's how we are, subhanAllah, in our weakness, we can only see just the next few steps ahead of us. We only see what's in front of us. We're not able to have foresight. Actually, we are able, but majority of humans in their nature, because of the lack of patience, a lot of us have short, we're short-sighted. But whoever Allah grants foresight, basira, to be able to see beyond this, Allah, that is paradise on earth. That is the ultimate success on earth. 
to have beyond what you see. For Yusuf alayhi salam's family, his brothers, they tried to kill him. Domestic violence, abandonment. He was kicked away by his own brothers. He was bashed. Um, he was scratched. He bled. He was only 12 years old or so, something like that, according to uh, the, the histori Muslim historians. Allahu alam. But he was a very young boy. They took his shirt off. They threw him down the well in the darkness, in the cold. He's crying. He, they, they hate him because they're jealous of him. And then they lied to their father. The wolf you know, devoured him. And they brought him a shirt. And they lied. And then someone came past. They took out they tried to take out water from the well and it was Yusuf Yusuf was a child they said wow in those days having a child was a lot of money they sold him for, as, as a slave he got sold and his brothers sold him they, they caught him and they said give us a few pennies he was treated like rubbish like trash and then they took him they sold him in the market he became a slave the wife of his master seduced him then accused him then the women accused him of a heinous crime of sexual abuse and assault he was he ended up in prison innocent innocent for allahu alam how long years and years innocently and within that prison things happened things developed then a dream happens with the king and because he knew the dreams all of that all of this part of the process in the end of the story, you all know the story, he ends up being the treasurer of the entire country of Egypt. So he's the treasurer just under the Pharaoh. The treasurer, I would argue, even more powerful than the Pharaoh because he, were, he had the control of everything. And subhanAllah, because of that, his brothers came back to him, long story, and they came feebled below him and he is above them. And he went over his brother, Binyamin, and brought back his father and his mother and their entire families and they honored him and respected him and apologized to him and he forgave them. And he said, this is how Allah rewards those who are muhsinin, those who react, react to calamities and sufferings and negativity with goodness. I'm not saying turn the other cheek. We're saying you remain, you, you hold your character together. You hold your manners together. You have foresightedness. You don't react only on emotion and anger. You act correctly and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what happens. You will become stronger and above all. Above everyone. Like an argument. If somebody's arguing with me and they lose, their, they lose the plot, they turn, they get angry, they shout, they scream. And you maintain your, you know, your character. If you just maintain your character and just look at them sometimes, keeping your head straight, almost 100% of the time, those other people later on go and think and, and they, feel, they feel stupid. And they will respect you for your, you know, and people respect you for your maturity. For example, I'm just giving you an example. This happens in marriage, this happens as a parent, as a teacher, as a worker, as anything. Right? Can you expect a judge sentencing someone based on his emotions or her emotions? No can't be a judge. A doctor acting on emotions, they'll tell him, don't. You'll probably kill the patient. So, brothers and sisters, this is how you rise. So, maybe Allah has a plan for you out of your suffering. Don't give up and don't just sit back and say, I'll just wait for Allah's plan. It does not work that way. Allah will not assist you until you, first of all, make a decision to move forward. If you move forward in a good direction, Allah assists you and completes your good direction. If you make a decision in the wrong, in the haram direction, Allah will also assist you. And what I mean by assist you, meaning He will facilitate. So you have to make the action first. Then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala continues the journey for you as you want, as you want. And sometimes Allah stops you along the way because He has a different direction for you. Things outside of your control, not your fault. Things within your control, keep going. And this is how you work in life. Until you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He judges us. And then He rewards you for what you've done. Or He holds you accountable for what you didn't. Or He forgives you. So Allah may have a plan. Be patient. The second thing to think about when a suffering happens. Good may come out of this suffering. So number one is a plan. And this one's about the same. But maybe good is going to come out of it. So it's not a long term plan but rather good. Meaning, you have to go through this suffering in order to get to the treasure at the end of the rainbow. You understand? Well, let's not call it a rainbow. At the end of the broken bridge. Go right through it. Piranhas in the river. Stormy. 
Imagine that you're crossing a bridge and it's swaying from side to side. There are broken planks. Keep going, keep going, they say. You reach the end, paradise. The treasure's on the end. Sometimes good can come out of suffering. In the story of Musa and Al-Khadr in Surah Al-Kahf, there's a long story when Musa went to this Khadr, Allah, I think it was Al-Khadr, and Allah told him, I gave him knowledge which you don't have. And Musa wanted to learn from him. When he reached him, the man, Khadr, said to Musa, Musa said to him, can I follow you and learn from you? He said, you can follow me. He goes, can I follow you to learn from you from the wisdom Allah gave you? He said, you can't be patient with me. You won't be able to handle it. He didn't even, t- he didn't even offer him. He says, you can't handle it, Musa. <laughs> and he's a prophet. He goes, I swear, if I follow you, you'll find me patient and I, will be, and I won't ask you anything. He goes, don't ask me a single thing until I tell you. He goes, all right. The first thing he did, like I say, he did a number of very bizarre things. Because of lack of time, I'll focus on one of them. He saw a boy, a boy, innocent boy walking. Al-Khadr went up to him, was nice to him, and then suddenly Al-Khadr killed the boy. He killed him. Musa said, what have you done? You've killed an innocent child. You've murdered. He said, I told you, you can't be patient. He goes, excuse me, I won't ask you another question. The story goes on. In the end, Musa salam was not patient enough. Only three instances happened. He couldn't hold on. And then Al-Khadr said to him, I'll tell you the meanings of them anyway. And the, the one we mentioned, the boy, he said, see, this boy, he had righteous parents. They were good parents. And they don't deserve oppression. And that boy, Allah knew he was going to grow up, cause his parents oppression, agony, hardship, and possibly even kufr, disbelief. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yani kufran, not like kufar as in disbelievers, but kufr mean to become ungrateful, to, to lose patience. So Allah, Rasul uh, um, uh, al-Khadr said, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to replace the, that son with another son that was better and, had, and Allah knew would be better than, than him for his parents. And what happened as a result? The boy who was killed, the boy who was born again, and the parents all, all alhamdulillah, ended up saved, including the boy that was killed. Why? The knowledge is only to Allah. Allah may choose, someone may not. But this is a good example of Allah having a plan or good can come out of suffering. Number three, it could be your test for your hereafter. This could be it. This could be your test. Allah decides to put you through a test for no reason whatsoever. What will you do with it? How will you react to it? Will you learn? Will you grow? Will you stick by me? Will you not? What will you do? Now is the time to prove when you said, I bear witness there is only one God and Muhammad is his messenger. If you say you're a Muslim, that's a privilege. But Allah said, (laughs) did you think that you will just merely say, I believe, without being tried and tested with that belief? Let's see what you will do. Allah tested Iblis by bringing Adam. He failed. What will you do? Prove your Islam so you can earn your place. So that's your test for you hereafter. And say to yourself, Ya Rabb, if this is a test, assist me. If this is a consequence of my mistakes, guide me. And that brings us to the last way to deal with suffering. It could definitely be, it could be as a result of your wrong choices. You made wrong choices, you were negligent, you forgot, you didn't follow the right thing, whatever it was, you took wrong advice. What do we do with that? That's also a blessing. You're learning. You're learning. And all this qadr, all this suffering is for you. All these four matters, they are all for you. So keep going and rely on Allah. And if something goes wrong after you do your best, don't say, Oof, if only I could turn back time, I would have done this and that would have happened. No, you don't know that. Just say, قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلْ Allah has pre-measured and what He wills, He does. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. Allah will not leave you, inshallah. Now, alhamdulillah, that brings us to the end of this series about qada and qadar. I've been listening to a lot of, through my years, listening to a lot of people talking about qada and qadar and 
I've listened to their questions and their confusions that used to be brought up in gatherings. And I gathered these questions, put them together. And this is what I presented to you, my brothers and sisters, in these last four lessons about Qadr and Qadr. I hope, inshallah, by the will of Allah, that I've done justice in answering them and helped you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and strengthen your iman and your knowledge and bless you with it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease in this world and the hereafter. Grant us patience and strength to persevere. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our good deeds. May Allah forgive our bad deeds. May Allah connect our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our hearts tender. O oh Allah, the one who changes the hearts at his will, change our hearts towards good. But of course, we, O oh Allah, are ready for it. And we are determined for it by your will. Amanna billah. We believe in Allah. Wa alayhi tawakkalna. Upon him we rely in all of our life. May Allah reward you, brothers and sisters. Jazakumullahu khayran. Thank you for listening. Inshallah, next week, I'll start a new series. And inshallah, I will go into the series of the Khulafa al Rashidun, the four caliphs Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, and their story, their history. This will probably go on for about maybe eight lessons, ten lessons, maybe a little bit more. It'll be enjoyable and good. And then maybe, inshallah, after that, we'll go on to some other companions and maybe some different figures and inshallah ta'ala if you have any suggestions brothers and sisters please put them to us the mosque or on the website on the facebook page and maybe we'll consider in um, addressing it hadha wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh